Hello YouTube, how you doing? Danny here from Noclip uh, with a special announcement just for you. Uh, you see, here at Noclip we just started a podcast, uh, which is kind of like one of these videos you're watching, except without the visuals, uh, and if you put a pair of these on, uh, you can listen to it on the toilet. So uh, we've done that, it's available on iTunes and Google Play and all the various places that podcasts are sold. We have an RSS feed up on the website, all that good stuff. Um, but we thought, oh, what if we put it up here as well? So this is kind of a test, I guess. Uh, the podcasts, they're not just a bunch of people sitting around the table talking about what games they played that week. They're kind of like what we do with our docs here on Noclip, highly curated, highly edited, uh, you know, produced stories, um, which uh, we'll, we're, we're putting a lot of time and effort into every single one of these episodes. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Let us know what you think of the podcast and also just let us know what you think about the podcast going up on the YouTube channel. Uh, we don't want to flood the channel with stuff. We've been pretty deliberate in that and making sure that anything that goes up is something that we're proud of. Um, and we want to make sure we keep that up. Uh, the podcast will come out probably once every like two, three weeks. It's kind of like whenever we want to do them kind of thing. Uh, so it's not like we'll be flooding the channel with them either. Um, but uh, yeah, what you're about to listen to or watch is essentially a, a video version of what the, 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 the audio that you'd listen to if you just had it on your podcast feed. So enjoy it. Enjoy the show. It's all about uh, Sergey Galankin and Steam Spy. It's an amazing story. If you've never heard about any of this stuff, uh, we hope you enjoy it. And if you use Steam Spy, it'll certainly be interesting. Uh, but yeah, let us know what you think in the comments below. And we hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Noclip, the show where we bring you the stories about the people who play and make video games. I'm your host, Danny O'Dwyer. Okay, I'm going to talk about European law for like 30 seconds and I want you to trust me that it'll be worth your while. Alright, 20 seconds, I swear, okay? Alright. Earlier this month, GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation, was introduced to law by the European Union. Its purpose is to protect people like you and me from the increasingly intrusive ways that our personal data is being used against us. The ramifications are already being felt, with websites and online services around the globe scrambling to change their privacy policies. You've probably noticed all the emails about this in your spam box. So while all this has been going on, Steam, the biggest online marketplace for video games, has introduced a new privacy policy of their own. Valve, the company who runs Steam, had previously said it so that every person who had a Steam account had a list of all the games that they owned on their public profile sort of like a bookcase showing all the digital games you've collected. The new setting made it so that all of this, the bookcase, the collection, was automatically set to private. No big deal, right? It seems like a pretty sensible change to make, but sadly this has had a knock-on effect that has made an incredibly popular and useful data tool all but useless. Steam Spy is a website that uses this public data to calculate game sales. You could type in a game's name and in an instant see everything from how many copies it sold to the countries it's most popular and how often those players who own it play it. Over the years, this service has proved itself invaluable to people like indie developers trying to market their games, Reddit users trying to learn about the industry, and games journalists mining for data. Steam Spy did something that was pretty important. It opened up a tiny window into an industry that had always been notoriously secretive about sales, perhaps even suspiciously so. So, why did Valve do it? Did it have anything to do with GDPR? And what knock-on effects will it have on the industry? Welcome to Noclip Episode 1, The Steam Spy. Sergei Galankin was born in Lugansk in the USSR, a city located on the border between Ukraine and Western Russia. His family moved to Poltova, closer to the center of Ukraine, and it was here that he played his first video game. 
my uh, uh, godmother, she used to work for a huge computer center, you know, like a, a secret uh, type of uh, uh, building, you know, so you, 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 you can't get in unless you get a, you know, a pass or something. But because I was a kid, they would let me in with, with her. And I was, I, I, I don't remember, like seven or eight. And uh, she let me, she would take me to, you know, to her job and she would let me play with computers. And they didn't have many games. It was, you know, they were mostly doing statistics and stuff like that. But they had Tetris and they had uh, Kingdom Euphoria. And back then, I totally hated Tetris. <laughs> 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 I didn't play it much, but I mostly played Kingdom Euphoria, which was a text-based uh, strategy game. Text-based strategies appealed to Sergey. From a young age, he enjoyed solving problems. He'd spend hours making small games on a programmable calculator. You see, the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s had restricted access to most type of electronics, so the computers available to consumers was limited to Soviet manufactured machines or expensive black market imports from the West. I didn't play uh, many video games until like maybe age of nine or ten because we didn't have any we had only like you know those old soviet arcades but then then uh, the tech spectrum came um, to our country and it was it was a revelation it actually was uh, the first uh, mass uh, computer in uh, in in soviet union not just in ukraine in, in whole of soviet union and uh, i i bought the first one uh, my, 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 no, well, not I bought it, my father bought it for me. And I actually assembled the second one myself because you could buy, you know, the scheme, you could buy everything, you know, separately and just uh, solder it. And it was fairly easy back then. And I've saved, saved a bunch of money, you know, doing so. Using his ZX Spectrum, Sergey would create games for himself. He didn't enjoy programming in BASIC, he found the code too restrictive. So instead, he opted to program using assembly language. His love of programming continued through his teens, and when it was time to go to university, he chose to study computer-integrated systems with a focus on neural networks. Ukraine has always been ahead of the curve when it came to developing algorithms. For instance, the first neural networks used to detect fake dollar bills were prototyped in Ukraine. Sergei continued his education and worked a bunch of jobs. He did page layouts at a local newspaper. He spent some time at a game studio focusing on edutainment. Eventually, he'd find himself moving to Kiev and taking up a job at a games distributor responsible for selling games for some of the biggest publishers in the world. What were some of the popular games in the Ukraine then around that time? What were any any stand out in particular? Well, I mean, it's it's your usual, save for Stalker. We were not distributing Stalker. Stalker was a, a different company. But you've heard about Stalker, right? That was the most popular game in Ukraine, and uh, I guess it still is still a lot of people, uh, I guess, are playing it. Uh, from our products, I would say World of Warcraft was the most popular game ever. I mean, it was selling like hotcakes, and that's that was just literally crazy, you know. You know, just, we we couldn't get enough of of it, you know, into stores. That was just unbelievable. Was it? Was there any games that were very popular in the West that just were not popular at all in Ukraine? A lot of like intellectual properties that are not familiar uh, to Ukrainians were not selling well. Like it was a Fifty Cent video game that you know nobody knew about Fifty Cent back then in Ukraine, so it didn't really sell well. Elsa was an awful game to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> not many yeah. copies of Blood on the Sand sold in Kiev. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sergey's greatest love was programming. He'd continue to code during his spare time, but there was something about the distribution business that excited him. Again, he was problem solving, learning how customers made decisions and using data science to find answers. Well, that and simply watching people. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely because you learn a lot about how people behave and how people consume games uh, by just uh, doing little distribution. And uh, I, sometimes I would just uh, spend like half a day in a store, in a, one of our partner stores, just uh, talking to people and uh, trying to understand how they behave, you know, how they're looking at uh, products on the shelves, how they're buying, how they're making decisions to buy. And uh, that helped a lot because uh, I mean, I, I like looking at stats and the numbers, but unless you talk to people, it's sometimes really hard to understand how they actually think, you know. Sergey would eventually take what he had learned in distribution and bring it back to the world of development. He spent two years at Nival Interactive, creators of the Blitzkrieg series and the developers of Heroes of Might and Magic 5. He enjoyed the job and life was good. Sergey was married now. He had children. But something bubbling under the surface in Ukrainian society was about to come to the boil. A few days after Valentine's Day in 2014, 
the Ukrainian Revolution would see rioters clash with police throughout the capital city. The tragic shooting of unarmed protesters would lead to the ousting of Viktor Yanukovych, the Russian invasion of Crimea, and the eventual war in Donbass, which continues today. A frozen conflict taking place on an area half the size of the country, a proxy war where Russian-funded proto-states fight Ukrainian government forces. Thousands dead on either side. Uh, I was in Kyiv uh, at the time. My family was still in Lugansk, uh, so we had to move them out of, uh, of the war zone. And yeah, but me and my, uh, and my kids were, and my wife were in uh, Kyiv. Was it a difficult decision to leave during the war? Uh, well, not really. I mean, people are shooting outside of your apartment. <laughs> it's kind of like a natural decision. So, yeah. Um, um, I, the moment uh, they started shooting, you know, in my area, we just, uh, I just packed my family and we left. A lot of people don't realize how, you know, uh, how the staff affects uh, game, de- game developers as well. I, I mean, one a friend of mine, he was uh, still living in Lugansk when the war started, and uh, he would drive to his office uh, and he, he would like he would hear, hear bullets just flying past his car when he would drive to his office, and it continued for like maybe a week until he's like, "I'm crazy, is what going on?" And I'm going to a job make video games. So he left after that. But I mean, uh, because it happened as, uh, all of a sudden, and uh, you know, you, you see it in the movies, and you expect it to be like in the movies, but it's not. It just you know, it's a it's a new type of war. Mm. You, you don't see a lot of tanks just rolling in. You know, you know, you don't see like <laughs> you don't see the front lines. It just just, just people start shooting. So he left, and uh, a lot of people did uh, around the same time. The conflict led to an exodus of Ukrainian game development. 4A Games developers of the Metro series relocated their studio to Malta. Sergei and his family left for the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. The reason was simple. It was the closest country him and his family could move to without requiring visas. As it happens, it was also one of the 20 or so global locations that developers wargaming had offices. The Belarusian developer responsible for the wildly popular World of Tanks. Yeah, Wargaming, Wargaming is an amazing company. It's it's huge and uh, Wargaming is really different from any other companies I've ever worked for, including in, and I've worked for Eastern European companies, not just for, for the Western companies. Uh, its culture is is really something. It's a conflict-driven company. So yes, you're expected to shout at other people when in discussions. You're expected to disagree. You know, like every time I go to a meeting with my um, friends at Epic, uh, you know, it's usually uh, I agree with you. I respect your opinion, but in wargaming, you would start with the bot part. You know, you would not <laughs> you would not do any formalities. You would say, well, this idea is incorrect because this and this and this, and I don't like this because this. And it, it really saved a lot of time uh, in discussions because uh, people know that everyone respects everyone. Otherwise, you would not be working, you know, uh, as a company uh, if you don't respect other people. And that let uh, people express their opinions uh, kind of in a more uh, aggressive way. Uh, Wargaming also is is really interesting because um, we're gaming, core, uh, the core of Wargaming audience are people that don't usually play video games. So uh, you look at the people that play in World of Tanks or World of Warships, they are over 40, most of them have families and kids, and sometimes they have grandchildren, you know, and uh, they don't know much about other video games. And they don't consider the World of Tanks or World of Warships to be a video game, they just consider it to be, you know, a hobby. Like, they would consider fishing to be a hobby. Uh, and that is both amazing and really uh, <laughs> demanding. Because uh, you, you know it's 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 a different audience. Uh, gamers are used to certain uh, rules in in video games, and gamers are used to change. Gamers are used to a lot of stuff being taken away. Like uh, people do not complain uh, when uh, Call of Duty releases a new game every single year, and you essentially have to rebuy it, and uh, uh, they take away all of your progress when you buy the new Call of Duty, right? Yeah. Uh, well, like, imagine doing that to a bunch of sixty years old uh, people. You know, <laughs> every year that's they would probably not like it, right? <laughs> <laughs> on, on the other hand, uh, you hear a lot about toxicity in online gaming, uh, and while World of Tanks uh, players are not 
not the most pleasant bu uh, bunch, they are way more polite than your average kids in uh, Call of Duty. So that, like, toxicity was never a huge problem in, in, uh, in World of Tanks. Every time people coming and talking, well, you're a free-to-play game, you're supposed to have a toxic audience. Well, not really. I mean, if you're 60 years old, you probably know how to behave yourself. Right? <laughs> Sergey worked as a senior industry analyst at Wargaming, helping the team find inroads into different markets. Aside from their core war games, Wargaming published games from other studios, and even worked on experimental games under different brands. Think mobile games about managing a coffee shop. It was varied work that Sergey found interesting. In the spring of 2015, like so many others in the international development community, Sergey took the annual pilgrimage to the Games Developers Conference in San Francisco. Here, he attended panels, networked with other analysts, and met old friends. One panel he attended was presented by Kyle Orland, a journalist for the technology website Ars Technica. Kyle had created a program that could pull user data from Steam, and using it, he was able to calculate video game sales. He called it Steam Gauge. I'm Kyle Orland, I'm Senior Gaming Editor at Ars Technica, and this is analyzing the Steam marketplace using publicly derived sales estimates. Now, I've been covering the game business for a little over a decade, and anyone covering this industry or following it, one major annoyance is the lack of reliable, specific data about sales of games. Now, it's not like this in most other entertainment media. It's just not a problem. Nielsen, for instance, provides ratings literally overnight for TV shows and makes the headline numbers very public in publications like Variety. Uh, theaters and studios provide box office estimates every weekend for movies. There's billboard charts for music, there's the New York Times bestseller list every week for books, etc., etc. So what do we have for games? For games, we have this. This is what NPD, a U.S. tracking firm, sends to the media every month. It's a top ten list based on their sampling of U.S. retail outlets and now electronic sales. If you pay a lot of money, you can get more details than this. You can get every game that they track and actual sales numbers. But people who get those numbers are contractually prevented from sharing them publicly, and NPD is pretty strict about enforcing it. You get occasional leaks... Back sometimes. in Cyprus a few weeks later, Sergey was doing market analysis for Master of Orion, Conquer the Stars. Wargaming was publishing the game, and Sergey was trying to determine market data around 4X strategy games. However, his VPN was down and he didn't have access to any of his data. It was then that he remembered Kyle's talk. Well, uh, it was uh, end of March 2015. Uh, I was still working for Wargaming. And the funny story behind um, Steam Spy is that my VPN was down and the office was closed for an extended holiday. And I needed to look up some numbers and I didn't have access to my data. And I'm like, well, I, I, I need this data because I have nothing else to do. And I... I was uh, just came from uh, GDC, and I remember the uh, presentation by Kai or Orland from um, Ars Technica about uh, Steam Gorge, and I thought, well, how hard would it be to recreate that? And he didn't give any, you know, instructions or anything how to do that. But I mean, it's into, you have internet; it's it's fairly easy. So I spent a couple of evenings um, writing it. And uh, by Monday, is I had all my data. I wrote my, you know, documents uh, uh, required for for the office on by the end of Sunday. And I was like, I was stuck with essentially Steam Spy without any any interface. And I was like, well, maybe I should just add interface and open that to, uh, open it up to everyone. Sergey added that interface, gave it a web presence, and shared it with the folks who listened to his video games podcast. Right away, he saw indie developers flooding to it. This tool, something he was calling Steam Spy, was democratizing data in a way the PC market had never seen before. What Steam Spy was doing was incredibly clever. The Steam Marketplace was the biggest online retailer for PC game sales, and by default, user profiles were public. Sergey's algorithm would pull data from between 60 to 70,000 profiles a day, and using that, extrapolate total game sales. It didn't pull every single person on Steam, but with enough data points, his algorithm could get to within a few percentage points of accuracy. When NPD produced its top 10 charts, all that that was highlighting was which games were the most popular. But Steam Spy, with its repository of data, was far more powerful. For instance, you could look at trends and see how much more games sold when they went on sale. 
Or you could use the data to see how popular baseball games were in Portugal. Unlike NPD, which just told you a specific thing, if you had an unanswered question about PC game sales, Steam Spy could help you get to the answer. Sergey had developed a tool for market researchers in the video games industry, but it seemed everyone wanted to play with it. It wasn't long before the games press started posting articles using data they had gathered from Steam Spy. Reddit was full of threads about games that were secretly incredibly popular. But it wasn't just hobbyists using it. Indie devs now had access to a powerful market research tool. And even large publishers were using Steam Spy. Were you at all worried that I mean you were using you were just using the Steam API right to, to pull this stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, I was. Uh, I checked the rules. I mean, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but I, I read uh, EULA. I actually read it, and I didn't <laughs> find uh, you know that I'm breaking anything. They changed the EULA after that, <laughs> but but back when it, uh, I launched it, uh, I was not breaking any any um, uh, laws. And I guess well, I mean, uh, anyone can estimate anyone's uh, sales, right? That's why we have a lot of uh, research companies. And uh, you have Superdata, you have Newzoo, you have NPD. They all are doing estimates, and they all they public uh, publicize them, uh, you know, online. And it, it is completely legal. Anyone can do it. Is allowed to do that. You know, as long as you're not stealing someone's, uh, you know, financial information, uh, you are allowed to do estimates. And, and you weren't surfacing any individuals' information, were you? you were, yeah, of were... course not. No, I'm. I'm uh, 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 European laws about uh, user privacy are way more strict than American laws about user privacy. So the, all information from the beginning was already anonymized. I was not never st st storing anything that is can be uh, used to identify a user. Well, when it launched initially, it was mostly uh, uh, you know gaming journalists, uh, small indie developers, uh, gamers, you know, into game enthusiasts uh, trying to understand how the market works. But I was I, I've started adding more and more professional tools into Steam Spy, like uh, cross audience research, uh, playtime distribution, and uh, the stuff that I felt is is useful uh, to me. And I've seen that uh, the audience has uh, shifted towards more professionals, and it's been. It's been interesting talking to people that actually use Steam Spy on at uh, different conferences. Intel uses Steam Spy, Tencent mm. uses Steam Spy, Electronic Arts uses Steam Spy, Ubisoft, uh, Activision Blizzard, you, you name it. I don't know a single gaming company that does not use Steam Spy right now. It's it became a tool that a lot of people in the gaming industry use because it's it's not great but it's good enough. And if you look into any other tools uh, available, uh, you know like Super Data Arcade is an amazing tool. Uh, App Any is an amazing tool, but the precision is actually way worse than Steam Spy's precision, and accuracy is way worse than Steam Spy's accuracy. And people still use them because having an information that might be 50% off is still better than having no information. One of the things that Steam Spy did great was validating the market. For instance, you could use the tool to see if fans of a certain genre bought lots of games in that genre. So, for instance, Sergey found that MOBA players rarely played more than one MOBA. So during the height of Dota 2's popularity, when every developer under the sun was trying to make the next big MOBA, they were trying to sell to an audience that largely didn't want one. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you look at survival games like DayZ, and you see that people that enjoy survival games actually buy a lot of survival games. And uh, that you know that makes it uh, safe to launch a, a new survival game like uh, Conan Exiles, for example. You know, you look at the market, you realize, well, people will uh, will buy your game and, and uh, you make a slip of face. Uh, people were looking into um, trends, obviously, and uh, it's harder to do with Steam Spy, unfortunately. I would, I'm using different tools myself uh, when looking for trends, but Steam Spy is, is decent at this. So you could look into what's uh, what's growing, you know, how uh, games are changing, what people are playing now versus what people were playing last year. If you look into audience for um, uh, playing on Battlegrounds, you'll see that, well, some of them are coming from Counter-Strike, so that's good. Right. A lot of them are, are, are haven't uh, never played anything before. So they just said they are newcomers to the genre, and it means that a lot of them will not leave the game because that's the only game they ever played or played in the recent years, and that it makes it really hard to compete with uh, PUBG and, and Fortnite uh, on this market, unless you're willing to do something uh, radically different, and that's where I believe is a lot of innovation is going to come from. You know, people doing battle royale but in a in an unexpected way.
I'm European, I grew up in Ireland, I lived in London for a few years, eventually found myself in California and now live in the woods on the East Coast. And one of the things I've enjoyed throughout my life moving from country to country is understanding the preferences of different people in different parts of the world. As it turns out, Steam Spy is really good at highlighting the types of games that certain countries like. I asked Sergey what were some of the most interesting geographical trends that he came across. Well, my favorite part is uh, the German admiration of anything that uh, has simulation in it, like the farming simulator and anything that has to do with simulation, really, they, they will play it. Farming simulator is a phenomenon, and it was developed in Switzerland, but is mostly played in Germany. And uh, you talk to anyone in America, and the fact that they have a trolley sim- uh, trolleybus uh, simulator, they have <laughs> right. a uh, trash uh, garbage uh, track simulator, <laughs> and people buy it and people play it, and that's just crazy. But that's that's how people in Germany particularly like to spend their time. You know, Japan. Well, back then was obsessed with zombies. Anything with zombies would sell really well in Japan. Was there any stuff that was very popular in America mm-hmm. that just was not popular in Europe, or vice versa? Do you kind of saw? Well, America is such a huge market, and when uh, Steam Spy started, it was still the biggest gaming market in the world. So everything that was popular in America was pretty much popular right. everywhere else. Uh, so they have. Uh, well, back then they used uh, to like uh, survival games and open world games. Uh, not as much like French people do not enjoy open world games as much as um, Americans, but the French video gaming company like Ubisoft, it's, it, it's the only games they make recently, right? They only make you know, open world games. Steam Spy was cracking open the sales data of thousands of games. As somebody who worked in the games press, I couldn't imagine this was something that publishers were particularly happy about. The gaming audience is savvy, it cares about consumer rights and it's quick to react when publishers do things that take advantage of them. Steam publishes some data themselves, like concurrent live players, but the amount of data that Steam Spy was surfacing was on a whole other level. I had to imagine that publishers must have been lobbying Valve to do something to lock out Steam Spy. I asked Sergey if he had ever talked to Valve during any of this, I just wanted to know. What did they think of it all? I used to, when I uh, worked at Nywall, I used to work with them because we published games on uh, Steam. And when right. I worked at Wargaming, we also published some games on, uh, on Steam. And they used to reply fairly quickly. Uh, but every time I would mention, well, I would not write from a corporate email, but I would write from a personal email. Every time I would write about Steam Spy, they would just shut down. They would, I mean, it would just literally shut up and not reply to any of my uh, emails or any of my communications. And I have um, a couple of friends working there, not on Steam, on, on, on the Dota team, and it's the same situation. Every time we discuss something, you know, like gaming related or something like that, or, you know, launch plans or something like that, they, uh, they, they talk. A- anytime I mention Steam Spy, they just shut up. I guess it's it's it may, might be an uncomfortable topic for them. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I feel like Valve is a company that has no leadership. It has no management structure. So there is no one to make a decision. And they only make decisions when everyone agrees to that decision. Or everyone on the team agrees to that decision. And there is no consensus about Steam Spy, I guess. And no one is senior enough. Like in any other company, you would have a head of whatever head of steam come up and say well that's my decision we'll shut it down or we will let it you know go and everybody will okay i might disagree with that but i will you know uh, i will i can live with that anytime they make any any decision you will sit and wonder why did they make this decision it every time they make something new it feels like a compromise you know what i mean it it doesn't feel like they, they they are making any bold unusual decisions and it's uh to me it has been a probably the biggest disadvantage in the last several years because they stopped uh, experimenting. They stopped doing something, uh, you know, really unusual or bold. Like, I mean, the trading card game in 2018, really? Just... (laughs) (laughs) It's difficult to measure the effect that Steam Spy was having on the games industry. He heard anecdotally about games that were funded through market research derived from Steam Spy. He saw publishers like Sega bring many of their classic games to PC once they saw there was a market for them on Steam. But one of the big trends that Sergey noticed was how his tool allowed indie developers to more accurately price their games. 
Uh, I feel, especially if you're a young indie developer, it's really hard to uh, put a price tag on your game. You always right. feel like you, you haven't made everything you wanted to. You, you, you haven't achieved everything you wanted to with this title. So if you release your first game and you feel like, well, maybe I should just price it $9.99 because that's a, a, no, a no-brainer. But it, 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 actually your game is worth maybe you know $29.99 because if you look at the past games, uh, the price points when they were released, they were priced higher. So maybe you should price your games higher. Maybe your game is unique and it has no competition and it has no comparison points. And if it has no comparison points, maybe you should price it higher because it's, it's something unique that people are willing to pay more money for. People are trained to expect uh, uh, AAA uh, quality from $60 titles and from $50 titles even. But if you go below 50, you go to 40 to 30, and people expect it to be an indie game, maybe rough around the ages, you know, maybe, you know, with, uh, better graphics than, you know, uh, $5 game. But they expect it to be an indie title. They are willing to forgive uh, a lot of quirks if the title is actually fun. This uh, is the biggest fear of any game developer, I believe. You, you, you're you making something, you're sitting in, in a, pretty much in a dark room, talking to no one but uh, other fellow developers from the same company, and you always think, well, maybe I'm not relevant anymore. Maybe people don't want to play uh, city simulators, and I've just spent four years of my life developing one. Maybe people want some, to play something different, and maybe I should just underprice it and put it for 9.99 in hope that, well, maybe if I don't make a lot of money, at least people will play it, you know? <laughs> Steam Spy ran for three years, helping indie devs price their games, helping large publishers do market research, helping journalists find sales figures, helping Redditors prove their point. That was until a few weeks ago, when Valve flipped a switch. On April 10th, 2018, Valve pushed an update to every user's profile privacy settings page. Up until now, if you created an account, your game ownership data was public by default. People could set this to private, but most didn't bother. Steam's update flipped this entirely. Not only would new accounts be automatically set to private, but it switched every account on the system to private too. Without this data, Steam Spy could not work, and Sergey quickly announced that the service was dead. At the time the update went live, the EU had just pushed through a new regulation on data security. GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation, was created to add new protections to users' personal data. As soon as it came through, online services around the world were changing their end-user license agreements to be in line with the law. Some services were having to push updates to get in line. One game, Monday Night Combat, would eventually have to shut down as making the required changes to their backend would cost more than the game was bringing in. Everyone assumed that this was just Steam doing the same, falling in line. But after a few days, Sergey realized it had nothing to do with it. Well, it, it's 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 not really related to GDPR. The latest change was not related to GDPR, because GDPR requires uh, companies to do a bunch of changes to appoint um, a person responsible for uh, user privacy, to change uh, the default settings, uh, to change. Um, uh, privacy settings for um, uh, underage uh, people under 18 and Valve did nothing uh, like that. Valve still displays your friend list, your achievements, your groups, your screenshots uh, uh, publicly on your page. Uh, the only things they hid was your uh, games. And GDPR actually does not require that. GDPR requires to hide everything else <laughs> that is still displayed. I don't believe it was uh, linked to GDPR at all. At, uh, so I, I saw that it was like that when they made the change, but after looking into it, I don't think it was uh, related to GDPR. So if that's the case, then it must have been related to what you were doing, right? Because is there anything else that's happening that people are pulling from game well, data? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, on one hand, it's uh, nice to think that Steam Spy was so disruptive they decided to shut it down, but it's really easy to, for them to shut it down. They just have to drop an email to me, you know, and I will, I will stop it. I guess uh, a bunch of companies are doing uh, similar stuff to what Steam Spy does, uh, only keeping it to themselves. Or I've heard about a company that charges like 1000 bucks per month uh, for accessing the Services that is similar to Steam Spy uh, has a uh, little bit more options, uh, but mostly similar. And maybe they were unhappy about those guys, and the only way they saw you know, to, sh- to shut it down is just to shut it down completely, so no one can use it. I, I guess that's that's one way to do it. 
but yesterday they shut well they didn't shut down but they made some changes rendering the store api um, uh, useless as well and the store api is the api that provides information about the game price game developer like the basic stuff like the genre and so on and a lot of sites were using that and it's it's now unavailable to them and i mean <laughs> what they did they improved stores privacy or what it 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 just feels really odd to me. Without access to games lists and with the store API changes, Steam Spy was unable to pull the data it required. This was a seemingly insurmountable problem. But Sergey, Sergey likes to solve problems. And in this case, he used machines to solve the problem for him. Uh, no, no, I, I no longer rely on uh, information provided by uh, Steam API at all. I use a bunch of other parameters. Uh, as it happens, uh, I have an unfinished um, a PhD in machine learning. And um, the topic, my, my thesis was uh, using uh, unrelated, well, using loosely related uh, information uh, to predict uh, economical outcomes. Uh, and uh, that, that's what I'm pretty much using uh, for the new algorithm of Steam Spy, uh, my algorithm that I developed um, when I was uh, still uh, thinking about uh, taking a science pass. And it, uh, yeah, and, and it works more or less. And uh, this is probably like maybe it's a stupid question to ask because it's incredibly complex <laughs> and whatnot. But what what is the what is the machine learning doing to try and figure this out? If it's not pulling from 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 statistics and and or from data and creating statistics out of it, how how are you coming to these numbers? Well, <laughs> that's the thing is, uh, it, it is kind of hard to explain. So uh, it, it 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 takes a, a really really huge sample of data, like uh, I would say maybe fifty million data points, and it it goes through processing trying to filter out the data that is uh, uh, proven to be irrelevant and trying to amplify the data that is more or less relevant and it feels it uh, feeds it into a neural network and uh, that neural network does, does its magic and uh, the problem with neural networks is the neural networks tend to overfit neural networks are great for recognizing images but are really bad for predicting outcomes that are outside of what they are recognizing so um, if you feed an image of a man to a neural network and say it's a man, and you also feed an image of a dog to a neural network, say it's a dog, neural network will be able to distinguish between uh, this man and this dog, but it's, it's going to be really hard for the neural network to, uh, if it sees a woman, it will not understand if it's, uh, you know, if it's a man or a dog, because it does not fit into any of those categories. And in case of uh, our of Steam Spy, we're trying to predict, well, uh, the game is, the game A has 10,000 owners, the game B has 20,000 owners, the game C is, has no, ten, no doesn't have 10, it doesn't have 20, it might have 30, it might have 40. Please do and predict that. And neural network are, networks are really, really bad at it. But that's what was my you know, PhD thesis, is preparing the data in a way that lets neural networks actually uh, work with uh, this type of um, uh, tasks. Yeah, and, and it works more or less. It's not perfect, I'm, not, I'm still not happy with it, but uh, it is... It works. Yeah, based on what I've heard from um, developers, and I have a sample of maybe 100 games, uh, you know, that provided me with actual data, it seems that uh, for most of them, for maybe 95% of them, Steam Spy, the new Steam Spy is within 10%, give or take. So actually pretty good. Uh, for some of them, it is widely inaccurate. For the rest 5%, I mean, I've heard about a game that was, uh, the difference was 15 times. That was just staggering to me. But for everything else, it, it seems to work. Steam Spy started while Sergey was working for Wargaming in Cyprus, but during the intervening years, he moved around quite a bit. In early 2016, him and his family swapped Nicosia for Berlin as he became the head of publishing for Eastern Europe for an American company in the online shooter space. This company was responsible for some of the biggest shooters in the early 2000s, but they were struggling to find audiences for their suite of online games. One of those games was a third-person MOBA called Paragon that would eventually shut down. Another was a remake of their classic arena shooter, perhaps you've heard of it, Unreal Tournament. And the third was a survival craft game that had been in development for the best part of a decade. 
It had sold well on launch, but the game was designed to be very malleable. With Sergey and Steam Spy's help, the team looked at the market research data and decided to take a swing at putting in a Battle Royale style game mode. Seeing as Sergey was working with the headquarters in America so much, he would eventually move him and his family to North Carolina to become director of publishing strategy. The American company was of course epic. And the game was Fortnite. Yeah, yeah, I was I was part of the team. Uh, I was part of uh, making the decision, and obviously we were looking at uh, Steam Spy data to see how the genre is um, is evolving. And uh, with uh, talking about Fortnite, the uh, original of the world Fortnite. That's the reason I joined Epic. When I, I uh, visited Epic uh, several years ago, they showed me uh, Fortnite, and I was blown away. I mean, it was a game that you could make into anything. It is uh, so flexible. It is. I mean, uh, well, it didn't have Battle Royale mode, but it had several PvP modes back then, uh, experimental PvP modes, and people, mm, you saw 50 versus 50, right? It, it is actually, well, the idea for the mode, by, you know, two teams building uh, 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 castles and fighting each other was actually back then in, in the original Fortnite, obviously not 50 versus 50, smaller teams, but still. And uh, Fortnite to me felt like a, you know, like a mold, you could make it into anything. And I mean, even when you talk about Fortnite, like we don't know because it's on the Epic Epic launcher, right? We don't know how many people are playing Fortnite. We don't know how many people are playing World of Tanks, actually, now that you mention it either. So your games have been surprisingly hidden behind this. Well, I don't have to. I mean, I have access to all the data that somebody else could. <laughs> both, both, of them have, uh, both of them have APIs that uh, you can access. For World of Tanks, uh, for, there's a bunch of uh, services, statistics services for World of Tanks. And actually, there are several services for Fortnite statistics as well. So you can see the numbers, actually. Uh, uh, it's uh, it just uh, Epic is a company that uh, doesn't like to brag about numbers, and when we published numbers, we had we, we felt some pushbacks from you know from the gaming audience because they felt like well we just look viewing them gamers as as numbers not as people, and uh, we are really sensitive about that. I mean we're try we're always trying to do right by um, by the gaming audience, so we decided to uh, do it less. It not completely stop it, but just do it less often. <laughs> After uh, I was, I, just, I actually decided to shut Steam Spy down after all those changes because I didn't feel like continuing. And I, we also had an, a huge outage at, uh, of Fortnite at work, and I felt like, well, I don't have enough time to, you know, do my day job. You know, <laughs> I also like to sleep sometimes. This didn't leave a lot of time for Steam Spy. But then I thought I've received maybe over 200 emails from people using Steam Spy asking for me to continue and I felt like well I mean yes it makes sense to, to do so you know people really like it and I, that's when I heard all of those amazing stories about you know people uh, companies starting a publishing business because they now were able to uh, see the statistics for a uh, game that were offered for publishing a company getting a small indie company from Berlin getting financing from the German government because they were able to prove that well the game in the genre that they're trying to make is going to sell and it did uh, it, it was really good so i felt well it's it provides a lot of value to the market and i like that yeah and i'm not doing it for for money or anything i mean i'm uh, at my current day job i am well provided for and it, it, it it's not that it's it's uh, in the fact that i believe that informational asymmetry uh, um, asymmetry of information is unethical in any business transaction and uh Steam Spy is designed to remove informational asymmetry from business transactions or from any discussions. As a gaming publisher, as a big gaming publisher, you have access to more information than a small gaming publisher or than a small developer. Then if you're trying to sign a contract with a small developer, you can abuse your uh, power, your access to more information to get a better deal that is not going to be beneficial to the developer. And we've heard the stories about that so many times, you know, even before Steam Spy, like uh, publishers abusing the power or big developers abusing small developers. And having this removed actually helps uh, the market overall. And, and do you feel like you're you're doing a service to the world of video games? I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing more good than harm <laughs> in, in this case, yeah.
My sincere thanks to Sergey for talking to us this week. You can learn more about Steam Spy and look up all your favorite games by visiting steamspy.com. You can also throw Sergey a few bucks a month for his efforts by heading over to patreon.com slash steamspy. Thanks for listening to this first episode of Noclip. We hope you enjoyed our first story. If you have any feedback or tips, you can hit me up on Twitter, ask Danny O'Dwyer, or send us an email, podcast at noclip.video. Oh, and hey, if you like the show, maybe subscribe, tell a friend, or leave us a review on iTunes. If you enjoyed this podcast but you feel like your eyes are missing out, a friendly reminder, if you want to watch some high-quality video game documentaries for free, head over to youtube.com slash noclipvideo. We recently travelled to Amsterdam to tell the story of Horizon Zero Dawn, and to Canada, where we filmed a documentary series on Warframe. All of our work is crowdfunded, so if you like what we're making, please consider becoming a patron of Noclip. We have bunches of fun rewards, including early access to this podcast, behind-the-scenes videos, and much, much more. Head over to patreon.com slash noclip to learn more. We'll be back with episode 2 in just a few weeks, and we'll be focusing on a game. One of my favorite games, in fact, a game from my childhood, and the creative team who left Lionhead to make its spiritual successor. Whatever happened to Theme Hospital? Find out in our next show. Thanks again. See you then.